the joy of writing. Zest, gusto. How rarely one hears these words used. How rarely do we see people living, or for that matter, creating by them. Yet if I were asked to name the most important items in a writer's makeup, the things that shape his material and rush him along the road to where he wants to go, I could only warn him to look to his zest, see to his gusto. You have your list of favorite writers, I have mine. Dickens, Twain, Wolfe, Peacock, Shaw, Moliere, Johnson, Wycherley, Sam Johnson, Poets, Gerard Manley Hopkins, Dylan Thomas, Pope, Painters, El Greco, Tintoretto, Musicians, Mozart, Haydn, Ravel, Johann Strauss. Think of all these names and you think of big or little, but nonetheless important, zests, appetites, hungers. Think of Shakespeare and Melville and you think of thunder, lightning, wind. They all knew the joy of creating in large or small forms, on unlimited or restricted canvases. These are the children of the gods. They knew fun in their work. No matter if creation came hard here and there along the way, or what illnesses and tragedies touched their most private lives, the important things are those passed down to us from their hands and minds, and these are full to bursting with animal vigor and intellectual vitality. Their hatreds and despairs were reported with a kind of love. Look at El Greco's elongation and tell me, if you can, that he had no joy in his work. Can you really pretend that Tintoretto's God creating the animals of the universe is a work founded on anything less than fun in its widest and most completely involved sense? The best jazz says, Gonna live forever. Don't believe in death. The best sculpture, like the head of Nefertiti, says again and again, The beautiful one was here, is here, and will be here forever. Each of the men I have listed seized a bit of the quicksilver of life, froze it for all time, and turned in the blaze of their creativity to point at it and cry, Isn't this good? And it was good. What has all this to do with writing the short story in our times? Only this. If you are writing without zest, without gusto, without love, without fun, you are only half a writer. It means you are so busy keeping one eye on the commercial market, or one ear peeled for the avant-garde coterie, that you are not being yourself. You don't even know yourself. For the first thing a writer should be is excited. He should be a thing of fevers and enthusiasms. Without such vigor, he might as well be out picking peaches or digging ditches. God knows it'd be better for his health. How long has it been since you wrote a story where your real love or your real hatred somehow got onto the paper? When was the last time you dared release a cherished prejudice so it slammed the page like a lightning bolt? What are the best things and the worst things in your life, and when are you going to get around to whispering or shouting them? Wouldn't it be wonderful, for instance, to throw down a copy of Harper's Bazaar you happen to be leafing through at the dentist's, and leap to your typewriter and ride off with hilarious anger, attacking their silly and sometimes shocking snobbishness. Years ago I did just that. I came across an issue where the bizarre photographers, with their perverted sense of equality, once again utilized natives in a Puerto Rican backstreet as props, in front of which their starved-looking mannequins postured for the benefit of yet more emaciated half-women in the best salons in the country. The photographs so enraged me I ran, did not walk, to my machine and wrote, Sun and Shadow, the story of an old Puerto Rican who ruins the bizarre photographer's afternoon by sneaking into each picture and dropping his pants. I dare say there are a few of you who would like to have done this job. I had the fun of doing it. The cleansing after-effects of the hoot, the holler, and the great horse laugh. Probably the editors at the bazaar never heard, but a lot of readers did, and cried, Go it, bazaar! Go it, Bradbury! I claim no victory, but there was blood on my gloves when I hung them up. When was the last time you did a story like that? 
out of pure indignation. When was the last time you were stopped by the police in your neighborhood because you like to walk and perhaps think at night? It happened to me just often enough that, irritated, I wrote The Pedestrian, a story of a time fifty years from now, when a man is arrested and taken off for clinical study because he insists on looking at untelevised reality and breathing unair-conditioned air. Irritations and angers aside, what about loves? What do you love most in the world? The big and little things, I mean. A trolley car, a pair of tennis shoes. These, at one time when we were children, were invested with magic for us. During the past year, I've published one story about a boy's last ride in a trolley that smells of all the thunderstorms in time, full of cool green moss velvet seats and blue electricity, but doomed to be replaced by the more prosaic more practical-smelling bus. Another story concerned a boy who wanted to own a pair of new tennis shoes for the power they gave him to leap rivers and houses and streets and even bushes, sidewalks, and dogs. The shoes were to him the surge of antelope and gazelle on African summer veldt. The energy of unleashed rivers and summer storms lay in the shoes. He had to have them more than anything else in the world. So, simply then, here is my formula. What do you want more than anything else in the world? What do you love, or what do you hate? Find a character, like yourself, who will want something or not want something, with all his heart. Give him running orders. Shoot him off. Then follow as fast as you can go. The character, in his great love or hate, will rush you through to the end of the story. The zest and gusto of his need, and there is zest in hate as well as in love, will fire the landscape and raise the temperature of your typewriter thirty degrees. All of this is primarily directed to the writer who has already learned his trade, that is, has put into himself enough grammatical tools and literary knowledge so he won't trip himself up when he wants to run. The advice holds good for the beginner, too, however, even though his steps may falter for purely technical reasons. Even here, passion often saves the day. The history of each story, then, should read almost like a weather report. Hot today, cool tomorrow. This afternoon, burn down the house. Tomorrow, pour cold critical water upon the simmering coals. Time enough to think and cut and rewrite tomorrow. But today, explode. Fly apart. Disintegrate. The other six or seven drafts are going to be pure torture, so why not enjoy the first draft, in the hope that your joy will seek and find others in the world who, reading your story, will catch fire too? It doesn't have to be a big fire, a small blaze, candlelight, perhaps, a longing for a mechanical wonder like a trolley or an animal wonder like a pair of sneakers rabbiting the lawns of early morning. Look for the little loves. Find and shape the little bitternesses. Savor them in your mouth. Try them on your typewriter. When did you last read a book of poetry or take time of an afternoon for an essay or two? Have you ever read a single issue of Geriatrics, the official journal of the American Geriatric Society, a magazine devoted to research and clinical study of the diseases and processes of the aged and aging? or read or even seen a copy of What's New, a magazine published by the Abbott Laboratories in North Chicago, containing articles such as Tubo Curarine for Caesarean Section, or Fenurone in Epilepsy, but also utilizing poems by William Carlos Williams, Archibald MacLeish, stories by Clifton Fadiman and Leo Rostin, covers and interior illustrations by John Groff, Aaron Borod, William Sharp, Russell Cowles. Absurd? Perhaps. But ideas lie everywhere. Like apples fallen and melting in the grass for a lack of wayfaring strangers with an eye and a tongue for beauty, whether absurd, horrific, or genteel. Gerard Manley Hopkins put it this way, Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose-moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire-coal chestnut falls, finches' wings, 
landscape plotted and pieced, fold, follow, and plow, and all trades, their gear and tackle and trim, all things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Thomas Wolfe ate the world and vomited lava. Dickens dined at a different table every hour of his life. Moliere, tasting society, turned to pick up his scalpel, as did Pope and Shaw. Everywhere you look in the literary cosmos, the great ones are busy loving and hating. Have you given up this primary business as obsolete in your own writing? What fun you are missing, then! The fun of anger and disillusion, the fun of loving and being loved, of moving and being moved by this masked ball which dances us from cradle to churchyard. Life is short, misery sure, mortality certain. But on the way, in your work, why not carry those two inflated pig-bladders labeled zest and gusto? With them, traveling to the grave, I intend to slap some dummoxes behind, pat a pretty girl's coiffure, wave to a tad up a persimmon tree. Anyone wants to join me, there's plenty of room in Coxey's army.'